Well, good evening, everybody, and welcome to uh, the second session this evening. We are now exactly halfway through the online Centennial Conference program. Um, for those that have uh, been here before, you'll be very familiar with what I'm about to say, but I'm conscious that there will be one or two people who are tuning in for the very first time. So they say that no plan survives contact with the enemy, and that was certainly true uh, with the Society of Army Historical Research's uh, centenary programme. This was due to be delivered live in London at the National Army Museum in Chelsea. Uh, but when COVID struck and it became clear that this was not going to be possible, then the organising subcommittee very quickly took the decision to bring the program or as much of it as they could online. And so we ought to thank uh, the chair, you and Carl Michael, Andrew Banford, Andrew Cormack, Carol Dixon Smith, Charles Street, and Eamon O'Keefe, who are the organizing subcommittee for the sterling work that they have done uh, to bring this program to you. My name is Dudley Giles. I've been a member of the society for over 15 years, as is demonstrated by the society journals over my shoulder. And I've been commissioned to bring this program to you online. We are using a platform called Demio. Demio works through your browser. So unlike Zoom, which requires you to download an app, in Demio, all you require is access to a browser, whether that be Chrome, Safari, Microsoft Edge, or Firefox. But it relies entirely upon the interconnect, internet connection at your end. So if this evening you are uh, having any difficulties with audio or video, then there are a number of immediate action drills that you can employ to try to resolve the situation. Uh, before you even do that, I would advise you to close down any apps that might be running in the background and which will be taking up bandwidth. Really, all you should be having open on your computer at the moment is your browser. And in your browser, I suggest that you only have this tab open. The first immediate action drill that you can take is to refresh your browser. For those that do not know how to do that, at the top left-hand corner of your browser window, you should see a circle, an incomplete circle with an arrow. If you click on that, that refreshes your page. If that doesn't sort out the problems that you might be having with audio and video, then the second IA drill that you can employ is to use what I call the IT crowd solution, which is to close the tab and then come back again using that same link that you used to join this evening uh, and come back into the session. If the second IA draw doesn't work for you, and if you are able to employ the third, then if you have access to another browser, so perhaps you're using Chrome this evening, but you also have Safari on your computer, then try using that unique link that you've been given in a different browser. If these three IA drills do not work for you, then I apologize, but there is little that we can do. But rest assured that everyone who has registered for the session this evening will receive a copy of the recording. And that will arrive in your inbox overnight and certainly by first thing this morning. Those that are watching this by uh, replay, uh, who are not here live this evening, but are watching the recording, there are a couple of nuances that you should be aware of. First of all, you do not see the chat box and um, we're seeing people introducing themselves as I'm talking. You will not see that in the recording. That means also that when we get to the question and answer session this evening, um, you will also not see the questions that Eamon will put up on screen. And for that reason, when the questions are posed to the panelists, Eamon will not only read out the question, but he will also say who has posed it. I think that's enough from me. I'm now going to take my camera off 
and hand the evening over to our panel chairman this evening, Eamon O'Keefe. Thanks, uh, Dudley, uh, for uh, letting me know about that. And welcome to uh, this discussion panel, uh, everyone. This is the third in a series of six, uh, which marks the centenary of the society. My name is uh, Eamon O'Keefe. I'm a DPhil student at the University of Oxford, uh, and I've uh, served on the council of the SAHR since December of 2016 as the student member. So tonight we will hear th th uh, three 20 minute papers uh, from speakers addressing the experiences and backgrounds of the rank and file during the world wars of the 20th century. This will be followed by a question period at the end. Please type your queries into the chat box during and after the papers. Uh, and as Dudley mentioned, I will read out the questions at the end. So our first speaker tonight is Josh Bilton, who you can see on the screen now. He is a second year PhD student within the Department of War Studies, King's College London, under the supervision of Professor William Philpot. His research explores the military identities of British conscripts serving on the Western Front during the First World War. Prior to his doctorate, he completed an MA at the History of War at Kings in 2016, for which he was awarded a distinction. Josh is tonight presenting a paper entitled, Forgotten Servicemen, Britain, the First World War, and the Memory of Conscription. So welcome, Josh. Thank you, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Eamon, and good evening, everyone. So, as many of you are no doubt aware, particularly those interested in the First World War, the experience of the British conscript has received scant attention, both within the historiography and throughout history. Despite some limited scholarship, historians have predominantly overlooked the experiences of these servicemen, concentrating instead on the regulars, territorials, and new army volunteers. This paper therefore seeks to address this imbalance by examining why the memory of these men disappeared from public consciousness post-war. Focusing primarily on the British Army, it is argued that this process of eradication was far more nuanced than first perceived and a consequence of three factors. One, the need to commemorate the war dead equally, regardless of distinctions in rank and or enlistment. Two, the British Legion's consolidation of ex-servicemen post-war and the establishment of a unified image when in public. And finally, three, the privileging of the junior officer narrative within post-war literature as a consequence of the pre-war values and cultural interests of the Edwardian middle class. Together, the first two factors render distinctions inconsequential, establishing an inclusive representation of the ex-servicemen, and, on, and onto this was superimposed the identity of the junior officer who came to symbolize all those who had served in His Majesty's armed forces. Now, the historiography of conscription within Britain and the experiences of those enlisted by compulsory means is limited. Most accounts concentrate either on the parliamentary aspect of conscription, the tribunal system that was implemented nationwide to advise on exemptions, or the 16,500 conscientious subjectors or COs who resisted military service. Now, a number of historians have, of course, addressed the experiences of the British conscript. Ian Beckett and Alison Hine, in particular, have conducted sterling, uh, if limited, research, emphasising the similarities between the conscripts and the volunteers, while Alana Bettel and Tim Lynch have analysed why the memory of the British conscript disappeared post-war. Their argument, however, is somewhat myopic and perpetuates the idea that it was an intentional process of exclusion as a consequence of perceived inferiority, rather than a more nuanced transition that was, as shall be demonstrated, as much the result of compassion, socioeconomic factors, and the commercial interests of the Edwardian middle class as it was the prejudices of a nation. Now, even before the conflict had formally ceased, 
It was agreed that all service personnel that were killed, regardless of rank and or status, were to be commemorated equally. This was because, as Alex King asserted, the dead possessed, quote, an equality of moral achievement which transcended any other distinctions. Ongoing discussions during the conflict had established that given the scale and cost of the fighting, particularly that borne by the ordinary citizen soldiers, the distinctions were discriminatory. In an impassioned speech to the House of Lords on 9th April 1919, Lord Balfour of Burley professed, quote, I think we shall all agree that after death, they, the British war dead, should be treated on an absolutely equal basis. Thus, despite contemporaries denoting inequalities between the conscripts and volunteers, in death, the distinction was moved. And one of the main reasons that the different identities started to merge post-war, for death was a unifying factor that, the, that to the Edwardians determined a man's character and his commitment to the ideals of a nation. As an ex-serviceman of the Rifle Brigade declared in the Hull Daily Mail on 17th May 1919, quote, Many a so-called conscript made the supreme sacrifice. What more can a man do? Indeed, the finality of death transcended such arbitrary connotations and is a stark illustration of why the memory of the conscript was eroded post-war, given that there was no higher act of commitment than death in the service of one's country. Commemorative and other memorial services therefore featured a language of collective endeavour and self-sacrifice rather than unwarranted hostility and division. Religious and public figures spoke in reverent tones about concepts that transcended distinctions of rank and status, such as camaraderie and patriotism. At the unveiling of the Halsham War Memorial on 28 December 1920, Lord Leakenfield proclaimed that this memorial would Quote, remind the people of Howsham, not only of those who died for the country, but of all who fought in the Great War, of every man who went over the top or who did their duty as soldiers in other branches of the field. Interestingly, of the 40 men commemorated that day, 17 or just under half were either conscripted or had attested under the quasi-volunteer scheme implemented by the British government prior to compulsory service in January 1916. Thus, as Lord Leakensfield's address indicates, when contrasted with enlistment data, the need to honor the legacy of the dead eclipsed the necessity of distinguishing, particularly when faced with grieving parents, close friends, and even comrades in arms. Such an approach was also present at a national level. During the selection process of the unknown warrior, an initial appeal that the body, be that of a 1914 serviceman, was overruled, as this flew, determined Justin Saddington, quote, in the face of the natural and logical assumption that the unknown warrior could and should be any one of the missing. This meant that the body could, in all possibility, have been that of a conscript, given the bacteria rich and rat infested soil of much of the northeast section of the Western Front, which would have slowly but actually very quickly eroded his body, uh, the, his remains. Furthermore, the decision to exhume an unidentifiable serviceman in favor of a 1914 body demonstrates once more the importance of rendering such distinctions redundant and instead establishing an inclusive representation of the British serviceman that simultaneously erased the memory of the conscript and yet enabled all to share in the process of commemoration post-war. Though unusual, distinctions were at times drawn. General Sir A. Hunter, MP for Lancaster, observed during his keynote at the unveiling of the Prescial War Memorial on 4th October 1919, that, quote, Prescial had supplied its fair share of fighting men, and it was to their credit that all were volunteers and not secured by conscription. However, the absence of such comments more widely emphasizes that these comparisons were rare and dependent on the circumstances of the bereaved civilian and ex-serviceman communities.
The rapid expansion of the British Army during the First World War also meant that there were more ex-servicemen post-war than in previous, any previous conflict. As a consequence, several veterans associations were established that sought to A, represent the rights of ex-servicemen, and B, maintain a semblance of camaraderie between all who had served in the armed forces. A number of initial organisations created between 1916 and 1921 were, however, rather uh, exclusive, discriminating along lines of rank, service, and even enlistment. By way of example, in response to a question about the number of conscript members within the Derbyshire branch of the Comrades of the Great War Association, or CGW, the chairman responded on 1st November 1919 to explain that, quote, a sufficient reply is that such persons are not eligible for membership. However, with the formation of the British Legion and the amalgamation of the four main associations in May 1921, such distinctions were partially eroded, for membership was open to, quote, ex-service men and women who have served at least seven days with the colours. There were, of course, elite branches. However, the development of a unified organisation meant that ex-servicemen had a way of channeling their spirit and energy collectively post-war. It also meant that they had a means of establishing an identity that superseded independent distinctions. Indeed, as Niall Barr observed, the Legion, quote, represented a new identity for veterans, one based upon comradeship and pride in past service. War service thus became, for many, a defining factor post-war, uniting even the conscripts and volunteers. In an oral interview in 1986, ex-conscript William A. Gilman recalled, we, quote, mainly exchange war experiences at the Legion. However, what solidified their identity was the persona they presented in public. For those some were lame and others blind, some non-commissioned officers and others mere rankers, their attendance at memorial services and on pilgrimages as, as a group meant that distinctions were rendered irrelevant and even problematic. The general public thus came to identify them as simply veterans or ex-servicemen who, quote, just want peace, as ex-conscript Edwin C. Bigwood noted. Indeed, the 1928 pilgrimage to the Western Front is a perfect example of how the British ex-servicemen uh, ex community became defined as a monolithic organisation post-war based on its shared wartime experiences. Organised by the Legion and British Services League, 11,000 ex-servicemen, along with their wives and children, travelled to the battlefields of northern France and Flanders to pay their respects to the dead. The variety of mourners was diverse, including ex-regulars, territorials, volunteers and conscripts. Among them was Arthur Brown of the Biddles, Biggles Way branch of the Legion and Clara, the wife of Augustus Behrman. Both men had attested under the Derby scheme, Brown being stationed at home and Behrman serving in the 15th Service Battalion, the Sherwood Foresters on the Western Front, where he was killed in February, February 1918. Indeed, despite their differences, the fact that both Brown and Clara felt comfortable attending the pilgrimage demonstrates that the shared experience of military service was a sufficiently unifying factor as to render distinctions insignificant. Moreover, when the pilgrimage was covered, newspaper reports concentrated not on division, but on how ex-servicemen were united in their commitment to the pursuit of peace. Writing for the Thanet Advertiser, Charles J. Mullet proclaimed on 10th August 1928 that, quote, the members of the Legion have experienced the horrors and futilities of war and wish to give heart to those who seek peace and ensure it. In the minds of the public, it was therefore their experiences on the Western Front more than, their circumstances, the, more than the circumstances of their enlistment that defined them and further cemented the image of the ex-serviceman post-war as a generic and inclusive figure. Various novels and autobiographical accounts were also published during the war. 
that documented the wartime experiences of different servicemen. Though initially gradual, the production of similar accounts proliferated post-war, steadily increasing throughout the 1920s before reaching its zenith in, 19, uh, in the 1930s. Yet only a handful of the several hundred that were published post-war were the work of ex-conscript servicemen. The main reason, states Ilana Bertel, was that few conscripts felt comfortable contributing as a consequence of the privileging of the junior officers' experiences post-war. The success of these accounts was because the experience of these men embodied the middle-class values of heroism and self-sacrifice that were cultivated pre-war. The conscripts, on the other hand, were viewed as the antithesis of this particular image, having been coerced into service and were therefore, quote, excluded from the post-war narrative. There is, of course, some truth in this claim. An analysis of the various memoirs that were published between 1920 and 1931 indicates that most authors either, over, either overlooked their enlistment status or endeavoured to demonstrate that they were volunteers despite some having enlisted under duress. However, the privileging of junior officer accounts was far more complicated than mere stigma and cultural animosity. For the most successful memoirs were also those that included a rite of passage from adolescence to adulthood over several years, and that concentrated and even started prior to the Somme campaign in July 1916 a period that for many held a certain romantic appeal that was subsequently lost with the onset of attritional warfare. Indeed, the problem with the conscript narrative was that it suited neither criteria. Most cons British conscripts were still comparatively young, both when initially uh, drafted and then demobilized, and their transition was far shorter and less pronounced, particularly for those who enlisted between, or oh, sorry, were enlisted between 1917 and 18. Thus, the eradication of the conscript identity post-war was more a consequence of circumstance and indeed the whims of Edwardian readers than a malevolent campaign intended to ostracize and envelop. Similarly, socioeconomic constraints hampered ex-conscripts from publishing their experience, given that a significant percentage were working class and were therefore, quote, poor, inarticulate, unlettered, shy, or it simply did not occur to them to write down what had happened to them, said Samuel Haynes. This is borne out in the statistics of the five accounts that were produced. Not a single author was either working class or in fact lower middle class. All came from privileged backgrounds. For example, Arthur Lambert, uh, had experience in the publishing industry and pre-war had been trying to build up a business of his own, while Frederick Augustus Voigt was a journalist for the Manchester Guardian. Thus, like their working class counterparts in the new armies, pre-war regulars and territorials, the ex-conscripts were disadvantaged by their social circumstances that constrained them from laying claim to a service identity post-war. However, because of the power of print, the volunteer of junior uh, officer narrative became established in the minds of the general public. As a consequence, this dominant image became subsequently more prominent post-war and was gradually superimposed onto the blank canvas that was created by the British Legion and the equal commemoration of the war dead. Indeed, this was not out of spite as first perceived, but because it was the most popular representation and the image that Edwardian society both wanted to read about are most clearly associated with the First World War experience. In conclusion, the memory of the British conscript disappeared post-war, not because of some pernicious cultural scheme intended to eradicate such, service from such servicemen from history, but instead as a consequence of compassion, survival, and even commercial interests. Indeed, the need to commemorate all who'd served meant that distinctions were complicated post-war for fear of causing offence to the bereaved and ex-servicemen communities. The establishment of the British Legion also eroded distinctions, the importance of fostering a sense of camaraderie as well as a, a shared mutual objectives rendered the differences between conscripts and volunteers irrelevant. An inclusive image thus manifest that came to define 
all ex-servicemen in the eyes of both the general public and the press. However, what determined and eroded the memory of the conscript was the proliferation of the junior officer narrative within post-war literature. That was then superimposed onto the generic representation of the ex-servicemen established by the bereaved and British Legion, thus coming to symbolize all those who had fought during the Great War. Thank you for listening and uh, back to you, Eamon. Thank you very much, Josh, for that fascinating paper. I'm sure many uh, in the audience uh, will have questions Again, please feel free to write them in the chat box so that we can address them at the end of the session after hearing from all three of our papers tonight. So our next speaker is Dr. Nina Baker. She has had a varied career, becoming a Merchant Navy deck officer on leaving school and gaining an engineering design degree in her 30s from the University of Warwick, followed by a PhD in concrete durability from the University of Liverpool. She has lived with her family in Glasgow since 1989, working mainly in the university sector. From 2007 to 2017, Nina was a city councillor. Now retired from all that, she is an independent historian researching the history of women in engineering. So tonight, Nina is presenting a paper entitled, Not Just ACAC Girls, The Experimental Gunnery Work of ATS and R WRAC women within the Royal Artillery. So Nina, thank you for agreeing to speak with us tonight. Uh, it's over to you now. Thank you. Um, thank you, Eamon. Um, th this piece of research that I've done over the past year or so came directly out of stumbling across this story completely accidentally in an indulgence book that I bought on eBay uh, when other forms of retail therapy were no longer available to us. Um, what I discovered was that in 1941, um, when there was a massive national drive to recruit women into the ATS, uh, for instance, there were uh, parades on seafronts at major seaside resorts they were trying to recruit maybe up to 100 young women a week into each of the main regions of Britain. Uh, there would be a march pass by local ATS women with their, their special marching song, Girls in Khaki, and practical demonstrations and displays of all kinds, introducing the various kinds of equipment. There were lots of pieces in the newspapers, PR pieces, and also uh, posters and leaflets and so on to encourage girls to join. And although many girls were attracted to the apparent adventure of motor transport work, the army was also seeking a very special uh, cadre of women with good or even excellent education and intelligence for some highly technical roles. At the highest end of such requirements was the ATS trade of Experimental Assistant Gunnery, or EAG, for which rank and file women required at least school certificate in maths, and their officers required degrees in maths or physics. Um, and indeed, some of their officers were rec recruited directly from the universities. The principal location um, to which such women were sent uh, was the Royal Artillery uh, facilities at Shoebury Ness uh, near South End in the southeast of England. Um, this is the gate to the barracks um, quite a long time before the Second World War. And I draw your attention to the variety of uniforms um, that the Royal Artillery men uh, near the gate are wearing because this is pertinent. Uh, in the advertising for the job, one of the things that was meant to make it sound more romantic um, was a reference to the special uniforms that they were going to be wearing if they chose this trade. And in the bottom right hand corner, you can see an image of some ATFs, ATS officers and um, a Royal Artillery officer inspecting some girls at Shoebury Nest during the war. And you will see that the girls are not wearing ATS uniform although the officer is, and the Royal Artillery officer looks more like 
somebody who's come off a, a posh yacht at the Isle of Wight than out of the army. Um, and this dates back to the Royal Artillery's um, history of its uniform in that from the very earliest days, they wore white trousers or breeches and a double-breasted blue jacket. And in the top picture, you can see an image from um, a summer exercise of some kind, and you'll see a lot of the men dressed entirely in white and one officer in, in a dark uniform. These white uniforms were absolutely the commonplace uniform for artillery officers and other ranks um, throughout the earlier period and up until the, the Second World War when um, battle dress came in. So although the women were told, the advertising said that they were wearing these special uniforms to be um, prominent on the various ranges that they were going to be on so that they didn't get shot by the, by the testing uh, guns. Um, that was actually not primarily the reason. It was, however, a matter of great pride for the, w, for the women of the ATS when they arrived at Shubriness to be given this new uniform. In the top left-hand picture, you can see uh, my collection of hats. The top one is the standard ATS hat, and the bottom one is the one that women were given to wear when they were working at Shubriness, and it's the Royal Artillery hat. And you can see in the bottom right-hand picture, three women working on reconstructing some shrapnel, and the women are wearing the side cap with the red top and the, and the blue surround, which is only, they were only wearing this on the camp. This is a picture of the Shubriness Ranges. The Shubriness Ranges um, go back well into the 19th century uh, when it had been used for both experimental and test work and indeed training. Um, and the reason for that is if you can see that it's a very flat area uh, next to the sea, which meant that not only could you see a long way, but if necessary, you could fire out to sea quite a long way and at low tide recover um, whatever projectile you had sent. This picture is of an early form of um, testing equipment and the shed on the left has in it an early form of ballistic chronograph, as they were called, this one um, invented by Captain Naves. And those wires going off into the distance to some square items, those wires are electric wires to screens that we'll see more modern versions of in a minute. But the basic principle was you fired a projectile through a series of screens at various distances. And as the wires in the screen were broken by the projectile, so the wires brought back a signal to the chronograph and you could test uh, timing and so on extremely accurately. This, however, is the actual um, equipment that was almost certainly um, used by the ATS women, because although it was invented in Victorian times, it was still in use up to and after the Second World War. This was invented by the Reverend Bashforth, and it is the Bashforth chronograph. Um, again, a series of screens in the distance attached by wires to the chronograph, which made marks of the timing as the projectile went through each screen. And the uh, in the middle, you can see um, a white cylinder labeled B, a paper cylinder, which recorded all this very accurately. Here you can see uh, an Imperial War Museum uh, publicity photo of women uh, involved in firing a gun, one of the rare occasions when they were actually involved in live firing themselves. Um, and the, the gun is aimed to fire through that series of screens you can see suspended from the tower. After the process, the screens, of course, had a whole load of broken wires and the ATS women had to take them all down and put the wires back in again. So this is them doing that. And the technical part, the reason that they had to have um, this excellent maths um, was because those pieces of paper had to come back um, to the um, headquarters building 
And these are ATS women in the Second World War um, dealing with the bits of paper. Now, what looks as though they're sitting at typewriters, that is actually a machine um, designed to allow them to take from the strip of paper the timings of the uh, shell passing through the screens. And the, the, the beautiful Victorian brass and mahogany dial um, panel behind is the um, electrical signal panel. In fact, this was known as the signals room, although not in the sense of sending um, telegraph signals as such. Um, and you can see that they were going to have to do some significant maths. That is one of the longest slide rules on the table that I have ever seen. And they had to learn to use this. They also um, were using um, theodolites, and this is a rather charming um, war artist sketch of a woman at Shubriness. It's called Timing, and she would have been perhaps timing the apex of the trajectory or something of that kind. It's extremely difficult to follow a moving target of a, a, you know, a shell with um, a theodolite like this, but that this was done uh, extensively. Um, a piece of equipment that far more women um, worked on was something that was developed right at the very end of the First World War, uh, known as the mirror table position finder. And this consisted of, as it sounds, a, a mirror table, well, actually a pair of mirror tables. And the operators looked through um, a, a raised eyepiece and marked with special pens in a special slow drying ink um, the position of the projectile as it moved through the sky. This was a lot easier to do than using a theodolite because you could easily follow something over quite long distances um, using this mirror system. And here they are doing that. It was done in pairs. So there were two women at each of the two tables and they were marking in this special um, slow drying red ink on the glass. And when a series of um, tests had been run, um, special absorbent paper would be laid on top of the table to take the markings off, to take them back to headquarters for um, the uh, analysis part. This is a similar piece of equipment of similar age, and it's known as the window position finder. And this was on exactly the same principle, um, two windows, each with two women working, um, accompanied by a timekeeper, and they're marking on the windows in the same way. This was particularly, but this was a lot better for uh, long distance work. It was more accurate for the, for the longer distances. And they could be firing quite a long way out to sea um, at Shubriness. There are not very many um, autobiographical accounts of uh, women doing this work in the ATS um, during the Second World War. But um, there is a, a, a really nice, um, a really nice recording um, on YouTube, which I'll come back to in a minute. Um, what they then had to do um, was that piece of paper in the bottom right hand corner is what those tracks would look like as taken off um, the, uh, the mirror or the window. Um, and then a whole load of um, geometry had to be done, as in the, uh, the, the, the picture of the triangles. Not terribly complicated, but extremely laborious and time consuming. Um, and I'm sure they were very glad to uh, be able to use slide rules for some of this work. Uh, so a woman called um, Joyce Owens, who did this work, um, there's a YouTube video of her talking about it, which is uh, a really rare example of, of such a recording. 
Um, and she says the windows were positioned along the coast going north. And you saw two of the group sitting down and watching. And we marked, we made marks and took the marks off the screen with special paper. The screen, it's so difficult to see, but it's marked as if it's like a graph. And you made the dot and then had to take the dots off onto paper. So that was the record to take back and give to the necessary department to deal with it. Another um, type of equipment that was in use was the kinetheodolite. Um, this was something that came about um, before the war, but not that long. And it's a combination of a theodolite, which measures angles, and a cine camera. And the KTOs, the cine theodolite operators, did every aspect of this work from loading the film, operating the, the kine theodolites, developing the film and analysing the outputs. Um, this was quite a frontline piece of work. It was used both in training and in observation purposes. And this is a drawing of how um, the anti-aircraft system worked. And these women operating the kinetheodolites were pretty near the front of that whole setup operating these kinetheodolites in association with the anti-aircraft gun emplacements. Here we can see um, what is presumably a posed photo to show all the different processes of ATS women doing the analysis part where they looked at the film and they would analyze both the uh, elevation and the azimuth um, aspects of the trajectory. And the next stage would have been to turn that data into graphs. Another extremely rare example of an autobiographical account is this book. I, I think it may be the only published account. Um, by Dorothy Brewer-Kerr, um, who describes her work. Um, and she talks about how initially, when they first started this work, they were just given huge rolls of paper that they not only had to um, put the data onto the paper, but they had to create the graph, the graph pattern in the first place. You think about buying graph paper now, the lines are already on the paper. They had to do that first. And then they had to do all the calculations initially by hand using um, log tab logarithmic tables, which I have to say only those audience members of a certain age will have any idea what I'm even talking about. But this work continued after the war, both um, by civilian and army women. The Women's Royal Army Corps continued to do almost identical work, again, with the Royal Artillery. And in this case, um, civilian women doing um, kinetheodolite work at the Woomera rocket range in Australia, often on behalf of uh, British uh, rocketry and missile development. And they were initially uh, employed as human computers to do um, manual mathematics with data but eventually they came to do the whole process and indeed to run the early computers that were introduced. Um, I, as a result of publishing an article about this work uh, last year, I was contacted by a retired member of the WRAC, Joan Pearson, um, who was kind enough to share some of her recollections and photos with me of her time in the post-war period. Uh, when she was uh, working, doing the exact same work uh, with slightly more sophisticated equipment um, during the Cold War era. And they were no longer wearing the, uh, the special uniforms by this stage, but it was very meticulous and demanding specialist work. As the... Uh, use of radar came into ballistic testing and increasingly the use of electronics and computers. This whole process naturally became more and more um, computerized. 
And the initial thing, the electronic velocity ana analyzer was a radar operated system um, that was used to test muzzle velocities. And the whole idea of keeping an eye on what your uh, ballistics were, how they were actually performing, gradually shrank and shrank until it became initially field artillery computer equipment or face as in these photos and now I dare say it's all done on a tablet but these women had the opportunity to do highly technical work largely invisible a bit not on the same lines as Bletchley Park but it was highly secret um, and they knew that they were elite women doing a very particular trade that they were very proud of right up until um, this sort of work ended for women in the WRAC. Um, the fact that the earlier women had a special uniform was very important to them um, in their sense of um, their contribution and their specialness within the ATS. It's been rather interesting um, to do this uh, work because it all had to be done during lockdown. Um, I couldn't get into the National Archives at Kew. I couldn't go to the National Army Museum. I couldn't go to the Royal Artillery Archives. There's a private archive at Shubriness. Couldn't go to that. And I've been highly reliant on um, people being very kind in sharing their personal recollections. And indeed, in some cases, um, total strangers lent me unobtainable books. And so as well as thanking you for listening, I want to thank many people um, out in the retired military community for helping me do this work. Thank you. Well, thank you so much, Nina, for that stimulating uh, paper. Uh, as I've said before, I'm sure many in the audience uh, have questions. Uh, so please feel free to write them in the chat box so that we can address them at the end of the session. So the final paper this evening will be delivered by Lieutenant Colonel Sean Scullion. Sean is a, an officer in the British Army serving in the Royal Engineers. He is a bilingual Spanish and English speaker who was brought up in Spain and is a Hispanic studies graduate from the University of Nottingham. His historical interests lie in the conduct of the Spanish Civil War, the Anglo-Portuguese Army in the Peninsular War, and other aspects of the history of the Second World War. He regularly guides uh, and is secretary of the Royal Engineers Historical Society, uh, is also a friend of the lines of Torres Vedras, and was secretary of, of the organization Peninsular War 200. Now, tonight, Sean will be presenting a paper uh, entitled Continuing the Fight, Spaniards in the British Army, 1939 to 1946. Thank you, Sean, for agreeing to speak with us this evening. The floor is yours. Uh, the story of Spaniards who served in the British Army during the Second World War is seldom um, discussed and little known. Looking back today at the role they played in the war, we can see that even though there were only some 1,200 in number, they had an active part across the whole of the British Army and several were able to make contributions at specific points. In this paper, I wish to map some of the contributions made by them, where they came from, how they ended up in British units, and I will reveal some of the individual stories themselves. Like many other nationalities, Spaniards would form part of an army of the empire in the epic struggle against Nazi Germany to con continue the fight, a fight that had, for many, begun years previously in the Spanish Civil War. Many were heavily politicized, but despite this, they would become proud of their service in the King's uniform. By the end of the Second World War, many would serve in the United, would settle in the United Kingdom and integrate into British life. For the Spaniards I mentioned in this paper, and countless of others who were, who were exiled after the Spanish Civil War, their story of service in foreign armies began when the defeated Spanish Republican army found itself in southern France and northern Africa at the beginning of 1939. Between 1936 and 1939, there were five main exoduses from the Iberian Peninsula due to the war. 
The biggest was between January and February 1939, when some 500,000 civilian and military refugees would move into France, mostly via the crossing points on the Mediterranean side of the, of, of the uh, Mediterranean side. And the last Republican um, soldiers were in France by the 15th of February. People's testimonies of their experiences from this time are some of the most harrowing of the end of the Spanish Civil War. Fear, the cold, long marches, extreme fatigue, bitter sadness and uncertainty. 50, day, 50 days later and the Spanish Civil War was over. But before that, a final group of some 15,000 managed to escape to Northern Africa. In France, the camps were guarded by the French police as well as Moorish and Senegalese colonial troops. Most women, children, elderly, sick and injured ended up in reception centers found further inland. It was to be the men of a fighting age who'd be incarcerated in the internment camps. On the 12th of April, 1939, the French government sent out a ruling that extended to all male foreigners between the ages of 40, 20 and 48 years of age to serve in the French army or the war ministry in one role or another as prestataire militaire étrangère. Spaniards now had four options. They could sign a contract as employees, either in the agricultural or the industrial sector. They could volunteer to join the foreign labor companies or Compagnie de Travailleurs Étrangères, CTEs, employed by the French War Ministry. They could volunteer to serve for a period of five years in the French Foreign Legion, or they could become volunteers in the newly formed French Volunteer Marching Regiments for the duration of the war. The structure of the CTEs was of some 250 men commanded by a French reservist officer with a Spanish officer as his deputy. On the eve of the invasion of France, 55,000 Spaniards were serving in CTEs. By the armistice in June 1939, uh, uh, by the armistice in June 1940, over 200 CTEs existed, meaning that there were some 56,500 Spaniards in them. According to a war history of the Royal Pioneer Corps, GHQ in France had, by the end of 1939, figured out that labor requirements for the BEF would be huge. Given this, it was decided that the British would have to turn to foreign sources of labor. Three sources were looked at, prestataires, Italians who were not prestataires, and men from the Spanish International Brigade. Soon after, 185 Spanish Labour Company was functioning under the command of the then Captain R.D. Smith. Antonio Grande's story was fairly typical of the Spaniards who ended up in the British Army. Born in 1917 in the province of Albacete, he had been brought up in the small town of Minaya. When the Spanish Civil War erupted, he signed up for the Republican Army and he fought mostly at the Madrid front. By the end of the war, Grande had risen to the rank of lieutenant, but had to uh, hand himself in with the rest of his unit. By the middle of January 1940, Antonio and another prisoner had escaped into France and ended up in the camp at Gours. Grande takes up the story. A couple of weeks after our arrival, we saw some outriders arrive escorting some humble cars. About two or three hours later, and the loudspeakers announced that Spanish volunteers between the ages of 20 or, thir uh, or th to 30 and who were willing to work for the British Armed Forces in France should go to the camp office. The 250 members of the company were soon moved by train to Brittany and housed near Saint-Nazaire. This would all come to an end uh, on the 18th of June with the arrival of the Germans in the area. Of the 250 members of the company, 16 were able to escape to Britain. One of them was Antonio Grande. In a quirk of fate, he and his 15 compatriots would be saved by a Polish vessel as it was leaving San Nazaire Harbour. They would then be incorporated into the number one Spanish company, and more of that later. Previously, in the north of France, several CTEs were working us and supporting the Allied effort in its defence. By the 4th of June, eight CTEs were in the Dunkirk area, consisting of some 1,400 Spaniards 
and had surrendered to the Germans. <clears throat> Many would escape to Britain, but the majority would go into captivity. Sadly, some even to the notorious concentration camp at Mount Townsend. The majority of the members of the number one Spanish company, which you can see here, came from the 13th demi brigade de la Légion étrangère, having fought in Norway in May 1940, Worrying news from France meant that it was eventually redeployed back to England. The troops were billeted at Trenton Park near Stoke and visited by de Gaulle in an appeal to join the Free French forces. Some did, but the majority decided to follow Vichy, Fran Vichy France. Some 300 Spaniards then carried out a silent protest for which they were imprisoned in Stafford Prison. The half brigade was disbanded on the 1st of July, 1940, and some 600 then embarked for North Africa from Bristol. The 300 Spaniards were, who had mutinied were directed by the British police to the port city, but they opposed their embarkation. A war history of the Royal Pioneer Corps tells us, arrangements have been made for their return to Spain. But since Spain was for obvious reasons, the last country they wanted to go to, the men had refused to embark at Avonmouth. Their French military officers thereupon contacted the French military mission in London for instructions and received orders that one in every three should be shot pour encourager les autres. At this stage, the British authorities intervened. So the number one Spanish company was established in September 1940, with now Major R.D. Smith as the officer commanding. Training soon began, and the company was put to good use straight away, working on the defences on the south coast. Interestingly, in December, the, the company was visited by Major Hugh Quinnell, who was head of H section of the SOE, which covered the Iberian Peninsula. Following the fall of France, planning was taking place for operations behind potential German enemy lines in Spain and Portugal should they invade. The only immediate source of Spaniards was from the number one Spanish company. Over the course of the next 18 months, some 140 members of the company would enter training at the various SOE training establishments. Some would excel in, the, in their training, and even though the sconces, as they were called by the SOE, would not see action in the Iberian Peninsula, um, a few were actually used in operations. The SOE training lasted from 1941 to 1943, and at the end, 23 sconces were earmarked as being retained for future employment. Amongst them was Esteban Molina, father of the actor Alfred Molina, who, when interviewed later on, about, talked about being deployed as a radio operator behind enemy lines in France in 1944. Back at the company, disaster struck in March 1941, when the Blitz came to Bristol and the barracks in which some of the company uh, was staying took a direct hit. In 1943, the company suffered a further setback. One of the sconces, Fernando Casaballo, decided to sell his secrets to the Spanish embassy, thus putting the sconces at risk. The company disembarked uh, for Normandy on the 13th of August 1944 and moved to Belgium on, uh, to the east of Brussels, working on forestry tasks until the end of the war. In September 1945, the company returned to the UK and was disbanded in Chard in January 1946. So from France, Norway and Britain, we now turn to the uh, Middle East and the story of the Spaniards who served in the Middle East commandos. The majority of these came from the 11th Marching Battalion based in Syria. By the time the armistice was signed, and after some indecision, it was eventually decided that the troops uh, would remain loyal to Vichy France. The Spaniards, though, in, uh, feared imprisonment and a potential return to Spain. Many deserted and three groups escaped across to Jordan and British Palestine. Before long, the British uh, authorities had over 60 Spaniards wanting to join the British army and were initially taken onto the strength of Queen's Royal Regiment West Surrey but soon after transferred to the newly formed 50 Middle East Commando, which was being set up by Lieutenant Colonel George Young, RE, in July 1940. Intensive training followed, and despite the language barrier, the Spaniards 
soon gained respect for their fitness and guile, especially during night exercises. The Spaniards were in two troops in B Company, uh, headed up initially by Captain Brodie and then later Captain McGibbon, who would command them in Crete. 5-1 of 5-2 Middle East commandos soon followed in October uh, and November 1940. In March 1941, 50 was merged with 52, due to many injuries and illnesses. By April 1941, Rob Laycock had established lay force made up of four battalions. The merged battalions uh, were called D Battalion of Lay Force. At the end of May, the battalion embarked for Crete. It arrived at Suda Bay on the 27th of May and was soon in the thick of it. Over the next few days, the Spaniards would fight hard, but their company position was overrun and McGibbon injured and taken prisoner. By the 1st of June, however, the evacuation of the island from Svakia was stopped. Over 30 Spaniards were taken prisoner and were fortunately saved by the quick thinking of Captain Cochrane, who had fought in the Spanish Civil War. He suggested they all pretended to, to be Gibraltarians, a ruse which seemed to work. The prisoners were then sent to Thessaloniki, then Poland and Germany. In a further quirk of fate, one of the prisoners, Joaquin Fajardo, would come across members of the Blue Division on their way to the Eastern Front. 35 Spaniards would be liberated at the end of the war, and the story of those who were able to get away from Crete is also interesting. One was Francisco Geronimo and was able to avoid capture in Crete for 11 months and was picked up by an SOE operation. Those Spaniards who escaped um, would end up in the Special Service Regiment and SAS, the Pioneer Corps, and even return to the Queen's Royal Regiment, West Surrey. At the end of the Spanish Civil War, some 15,000 Republicans had fled to North Africa. Their numbers were further increased as Vichy moved Spaniards from France. One of the most, uh, one of the worst places to be imprisoned ended up being the, the French concentration camp at Jelfa. By the middle of 1942, the numbers at the camp had reached nearly 800, of whom 386 were Spaniards. Along with the recruitment of underground Spanish groups across Tunisia, Algeria and Morocco, Massingham, a joint project of the SOE and OSS in Algiers, which opened in February 1943, became the main command hub and training centre for uh, special operations into southwestern Europe. This, in turn, provided the opportunity for many Spaniards to carry out guerrilla-type operations on behalf of the Allies. In his memoirs, Agustín Roaventura talks of the many Spaniards who were whisked away in the night from Jelfa to become instructors or even fighters behind German and Italian lines. Agustín Roaventura, however, would become one of the 794 documented Spaniards in North Africa who would sign up and join the Pioneer Corps. Initially, 337 and 338 alien pioneer companies were established and contained mostly Spaniards, and a further company was established in Morocco, 401. 361, 362, 363 and 364 were formed at the end of April 1943. They were used to guard enemy POWs, work on trains and work in ports and warehouses, and the Spaniards soon got to work. Some supported the invasion of Sicily and eventually Italy itself. 361 Company was also joined by half a dozen Spaniards who'd been in 50 Middle East Commando who had escaped from Crete. By October 1944, it was decided to send 361, 362 and 363 to the UK. 50 or so of the members of 361 would end up augmenting the number one Spanish company in, Flan in uh, the Ardennes soon after. In the UK, the three companies carried out a series of key support duties, meaning that they would not be demobilized until late 1946 or early 1947. Whilst we know that Francisco Geronimo and Justo Valerdi from the Middle East Commandos joined the SAS, the remainder joined via the Pioneer Corps in North Africa. Most were probably involved in the Massingham project or simply volunteered to join the ranks of 2nd SAS when extra training was carried out in centres like Philippeville or Maison Blanche. The Spaniards also changed their names to English-sounding ones like Robert Bruce, John Coleman and Frank Williams.
By early 1944, the SAS had grown considerably in size and consisted of five regiments. One and second SAS were mostly British, whilst third and fourth SAS were French and fifth Belgium. A further half dozen Spaniards also served in third and fourth SAS from the Free French Army. Following intense training in Scotland and parachute training, first and second SAS were heavily involved in operations in France and Germany and also Italy. Ángel Camarena was a serving soldier in the Spanish army in the Canaries and posted to the driver's pool prior to the beginning of the Spanish Civil War. In fact, he may have been one of a pool of chauffeurs who drove senior officers and could have even driven Franco himself. But by August 1936, he'd been condemned to death. And by luck, the day he was due to be shot, he managed to jump overboard from a prison ship and got picked up by a passing Royal Naval frigate. Regrettably, he was handed back to the Spaniards, but saved from death and sent to an internment camp in Morocco, where he remained until 1941. On liberation, he returned to Spain, but moved to North Africa after the torch landings and volunteered for the Pioneer Corps, soon going through SAS selection and joining 2nd SAS. He then fought in France before being involved on Operation Archway, where members of the SAS drove deep into German territory. Another similar operation was Octombola in Italy, which was organized to, to harass the enemy to the southwest of Medina. This happened between the 4th of March and the 24th of April 1945 and was led by Major Roy Ferran. Three Spaniards would take part in Tombola. They were Bruce, known as Baler, who was actually called Balerdi, Williams, previously known as Geronimo, and Ramos. During the attack on the German 51st Corps headquarters at Albinea on the 26th and 27th of March 1945, all three would distinguish themselves. But in particular, it would be Rafael Ramos who would be awarded the military medal for showing remarkable courage both during and after the attack. Ramos had escaped uh, and rescued an injured officer and with another SAS member had whisked him away on a ladder, avoiding capture for several days. Sadly, Bruce lost his life when killed during a Jeep attack on the 21st of April. Second SAS would be disbanded towards the end of 1945 and the Spaniards who served in it would settle in the United Kingdom. Private Villanova had escaped Crete with some 50, with 50 Middle East Commando and rejoined the 1st 5th Battalion of the Queen's War Regiment West Surrey in 1943. He was immediately in action after the invasion of Italy and at the crossing of the Volturno he would distinguish himself and be awarded the military medal for his bravery. Lucio Sauquillo Echavarria and Jose Maria Irala were proud Basque refugee children who had escaped um, Spain in 1937 and then remained in Britain at the beginning of the Second World War. Both volunteered to join the British Army and had trans transferred to airborne forces in early 1944. Lucio Sauquillo was killed a few days after D-Day as a member of the 12th Parachute Battalion in the area of Breville. He had already lost two brothers in the Spanish Civil War. Joe Irala, as he was called, joined 1st Airborne Reconnaissance Squadron and was killed in action on the 20th of September during the Battle of Arnhem. Finally, we have the fascinating story of Sergeant Alfonso Ganoas, top right hand corner there. He joined the Pioneer Corps in North Africa in 1943 and volunteered for the SOE as his family had resided in southern France. He was parachuted into the area of Foix in early August 1944, where he joined up with the Spanish Maquis. For his bravery, during the liberation of Foix, he was, he was awarded the military medal. The end of the war brought much uncertainty to the Spaniards who were in Great Britain. Whilst the 400 or so members of the number one Spanish company, SAS and 50 Middle East Commando were given the immediate opportunity to stay, others were not so lucky. And this is where Agustin Roa Ventura comes back in and plays an important role. He visited London shortly after the war to petition Labour MPs regarding the Spaniards' plight. In 1946, it was agreed that the Spaniards who had been recruited in North Africa 
and were in Britain would not need to go back and could stay. Many Spaniards did, but many decided to go elsewhere. And it is important to know that at this time, many of these veterans felt that Britain had let them down by not going, to, going for Franco next. But despite this, many Spaniards settled in the United Kingdom and applied for naturalization. Some remained politically active during the period of the Franco regime. And in London, a Spanish ex-servicemen's association was set up in 1960. So to conclude, Spaniards who served in the British army between 1939 and 1946 experienced many things. Most had been born when Spain was a neutral country during the First World War and had undergone its industrial revolution. As children, they had been in Spain under the dictatorship of Primo de Rivera in the 1920s. In the early 1930s, they had witnessed the establishment of a republic, the deposing of the monarchy and the subsequent civil war. In 1939, they had been forced to take refuge in France and be interned. At the outbreak of the Second World War, they had fought on the losing side with the French, but many had taken their chances and joined the British Army to continue the fight against fascism until victory in 1945. Thank you very much. Thank you, Sean, for that really interesting paper uh, to conclude our, our even, this evening's proceedings. All, all three, I feel, have just been really interesting uh, and I think highlight the variety of experiences of servicemen and women in both world wars, maybe broadening perhaps our understanding of what the, what the words rank and file mean. We see uh, women, we see conscripts, we see uh, 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 Spaniards all participating in a variety of roles. Uh, we are now moving into the question and answer period uh, of the evening. Uh, this will run till half past nine. All three panelists, I'd ask them to uh, turn their video on uh, now. I will turn mine off and I will uh, session almost as a voice of God, if you will, as the uh, three speakers uh, uh, remain uh, with their videos on on the screen. I'll be reading out questions from the chat box aiming to alternate between questions addressed to each of our three speakers uh, in turn. And please do feel free to post further questions in the chat box uh, and we'll aim to address them uh, if time permits. So I'll start with the first one uh, 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 offered to our first speaker, Josh. Uh, this is a question from Andrew. Uh, I'm going to just flag it on the screen now. Um, to what extent were the conscripts of the First World War sort of willing to go? And to what extent were they entirely unwilling conscripts? Um, thank you for that, Andrew. That's actually a really, really good question. I think like anything, um, it's impossible to give a black and white answer. Um, I think in the past, it's very much been felt that the conscripts were unwilling, all of them as a kind of blanket rule. But actually, more recently, evidence has suggested that most of them, the majority, I would say, were quite happy to serve. You know, many of them had reasons why they didn't. It might have been, you know, family commitments. It might have been professional. It might have been, I don't know, just, yeah, anything that you can think of. And then there's also, you know, kind of once conscription actually comes in in 1916, January, and then in May, and then, you know, it's kind of revamped as the years go on. A lot of people, especially the 18 and 19 year olds, just wait until, you know, they're called up rather than kind of enlisting or volunteering prior to it. So I think, although there were many conscripts who were unwilling, um, and that comes through in a lot of the, 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 the literature that's out there, um, you know, for example, the guy I mentioned, Frederick Voigt, he particularly hated being in the army. Um, but I think, you know, he, he, he and many of his fellow soldiers were kind of, uh, you know, sort of an, an insignificant percentage of the, the, the British conscripts, of, uh, you know, within the British Army at that time. So, yeah, I think majority, I would say, were willing, ultimately, and quite happy to serve. Okay, thank you, Josh, for answering that question. We're now going to move on to one posed by Christopher. This is for Nina. Uh, and Christopher would like to know... Uh, when did the WRAC cease performing uh, these roles that you were mentioning uh, throughout your talk 
uh, in the Royal Artillery? Mm. I, I'm not too sure. The, 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 the latest dates that I have from uh, women who contacted me are in the mid to late 80s. Um, uh, and certainly a lot of these ranges um, were initially, it all started off all the research, all the proofing and testing of equipment and, and ammunition and explosives was all being done by the army for its own purposes. Um, and gradually, um, in the later part of the 20th century, this became more and more something that was done um, in, in one of the research establishments. And then they, of course, were all privatized in the 1990s, um, initially through the Defense Establishment Research Agency and then completely privatized and sold off. So the work kind of vanished from under their feet as time went on. Um, I, I suspect also that this was running in parallel with a complete change from this um, very laborious manual work to something that was largely being done by computers in any case. And so the work disappeared into other places. Having said which, um, women in engineering, while still in a, a large majority, um, are clustered in the defense electronics industry. So some, some, of the, uh, some of the work is still being done in different ways. Great. Thank you, Nina, for your response. I'm going to move to a question now for Sean, the third speaker. Uh, this is from Andrew. Andrew asks, was any attempt made to assign British officers to command the Spaniards who had knowledge or experience of Spain uh, and or some ability to speak Spanish? Yes, is the answer. Uh, Spanish number one company, um, uh, Smith, I mentioned before, um, he was uh, he had already uh, commanded the 185 Labour Company. Uh, uh, his successor a bit further down the line was a South American uh, of South American origin. Well, he was an expat South American, so and they called him El Comandante. So you know he was already uh, well known for that. Middle East Commando. Uh, there were some Spanish speakers when the Middle East Commando first arrived. Um, uh, in the guys who, who who arrived in Syria, there were a few language issues, as I mentioned, um, and, but they did manage to find some uh, ex Spanish Civil War veterans. Mostly New Ze there was a New Zealander and a couple of others who uh, acted as translators. But a couple of the officers who commanded uh, the guys in the Middle East commandos did have a Spanish background. One of them was Gibraltarian, but sadly had fought on the fascist side of the Spanish Civil War, so that didn't go too well. Um, those who were in the SOE, um, the SOE guys uh, from number one Spanish company, uh, I've talked about them being called sconces. Well, actually, there was another group um, uh, called Relators, and Relators were a group of British officers of a, with either a Spanish or a South American background. And there's a really interesting story of Peter Kemp, a really well-known um, Spanish uh, fascist sympathizer who fought in the Spanish Civil War, who ended up in the SOE in the Balkans. He was going to be in charge of a group of sconces Luckily, it never happened. I think they probably would have lynched him after about five minutes. Um, and then in North Africa, there's a real mixed bag. Um, in North Africa, there are some amazing stories of some of the pioneer companies having nobody who could speak any English, um, having to go through German and maybe even French in order to get the officer to understand what they were trying to do. So actually, there were, I think North Africa was where they probably had the biggest language issues. But on the whole, especially by 1943, I would say fairly, fairly good. The Spanish, the Spanish on the whole knew a lot more English, especially the ones who'd been there from the beginning. But obviously, it was a, a tried and tested method with a lot of the alien companies to try and make sure that they had the right support. Okay, brilliant. Thank you, Sean, for your response. We'll now move on to another question for our first speaker, Josh. Uh, this is a question from Edwin. Edwin would like to know, were conscripted men identified as being suitable for commissions actually trained and sent out as officers? Um, so this is not my 
particular area, but I have been in contact with a, a very, uh, another PhD student at King's actually called um, Charles Fair, who's looking at, um, I think it's fourth OCB, um, and he's looking at kind of uh, the professionalization of the officer corps, uh, the late war, you know, within the late war um, British Army. Um, one of the things he has identified is, you know, from a number of conscripts that he has uh, found within the ranks that they were indeed identified quite early during training and kind of funneled into it. However, and having spoken to him actually weirdly just yesterday, he was explaining that the majority of, um, you know, if, if there's, I can't remember exactly how many, you know, kind of um, men were commissioned during the war, whether it was from the new armies, territorials, pre-wars or conscripts. But of that number, he suggested, and it, it was quite high from what I remember, um, of, that num of that number, it was only a very small percentage who were actually identified, you know, as, as conscripts and then kind of funneled through this process. Um, I think ultimately, and one of the things that he's identified further is that a lot of the time what they were looking for was experience. It wasn't just that, you know, you'd previously worked as a foreman or that you were a manager within a... Um, a, a factory or something, it was actually that you had that experience, but you also had maybe 18 months experience on the Western Front or in Palestine or wherever else. And so you could bring a lot of that kind of first world experience, you know, that, that, that first hand experience, sorry, to the actual uh, process of becoming an officer and training for it. And I think ultimately that's what they were looking for, which would have disadvantaged a lot of conscripts, especially the guys coming in in late 1917, early 1918, who, you know, had a very, very short transition, as I uh, talked about in my paper. So, yeah, yeah, so I think it's only a very small percentage. Great. Thank you, Josh, for your response. We're now going to move on to another question for Nina, our second speaker. Uh, this is from... Chris, Chris's question is, he wants to know, were any of the w, uh, Second World War AT, uh, ATS members in this role uh, given formal artillery training of any sort? Well, what constitutes formal training? Um, most of these women were recruited straight out of basic training. So they'd had whatever level of ATS basic training was on offer at the given time of the war. Um, and they were sent straight to Shubriness, often only having the very vaguest idea of what they were being expected to do. And all the training they had for the work at Shubriness and eventually other places, um, such as uh, Aberforth on the Welsh coast, was all done on the job, um, um, either by uh, the, the Royal Artillery NCOs or by their own NCOs and officers. Uh, there was, they weren't sent to a school. Um, actually, one of the first things that I that alerted me to this interesting story was um, in newspaper articles and advertisements, it was said that the women were going to be sent to the Army School of Experimentation. As far as I can make out, no such school ever existed. Um, and it was just something that was thought was going to happen and never did. Um, but we know from the photos that they did actually operate the guns, um, including some quite heavy guns. So they must again have had on the job training at the ranges. You know, here is how we fire a gun here. You hold this shell to girls and you put it in here and this is what we do next. But there's no record of them having any formal training as such. Brilliant. Thank you, Nina. I've got another question for Sean here. Uh, this is a question from Nick. Uh, Nick asks, with regard to the politics of Spanish Republican soldiers, did the British Army show them any suspicion as to their reliability as they did towards Tom Winteringham, uh, who had commanded the British Battalion of the International Brigade, uh, despite, and despite his work with the Home Guard, uh, because of his communist past? Um, uh, yes, they, uh, they, they were, they were, they were regarded as reds to, uh, at, especially at the beginning of the, the war. Um, but actually, as you, as you've heard with the Spanish number one company, for example, 148, I think it was in the end, uh, ended up doing SOE training. So there was obviously a, a requirement for, for them to be needed. And there, there were certain things that were allowed to happen, you know, it, they wouldn't have recruited them otherwise. However, 
by 1943 and the mass uh, recruitment of Spaniards in uh, North Africa um, after Operation Torch, I think by then a lot of the uh, a lot of the way of doing business from a British Army point of view was very much you know a needs must, and quite a lot of these um, these kind of barriers were, were were got rid of. There weren't any issues in in the Middle East uh, at the beginning of the war for sure. Um, so yeah, so I think I think there was a little bit of uh, reticence at the beginning, but uh, but 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 you know as the war progressed, there, there didn't seem to be. I and mean, obviously, I've, I've talked about the members of the SAS. There were ten Spaniards that I've found so far in the SAS, um, in the British SAS, and one and two SAS, or actually um, two SAS, and then the six that I found in uh, in four, uh, three and four SAS, and there were no issues at all with them. And that was later in the war as well. So so yeah, so I think yeah, a little bit of suspicion to start with, but not so much towards the end. Great, thank you, Sean. Uh, we've got one further question. Uh, this is from Paul, uh, and this is uh, for Nina. Um, this is a he'd like to know whether the, the, he he mentions the ATS work sounds a lot like the work shown in the film uh, Hidden Figures. Uh, and now, just for those who don't know, that was a film uh, that came out a couple of years ago about African American mathematicians, female mathematicians who were involved in, in, in the work leading up to the space race. And uh, I understand they experienced gender and racial discrimination. And the, that's something the film portrays as well as their own, their work within the uh, uh, within NASA. Um, so Paul would like to know uh, whether uh, the, uh, the work uh, uh, of the women that you've documented, uh, it was viewed in the same way uh, or has some parallels. Um, insofar as they were doing routine calculations um, that were actually quite sophisticated uh, for the time, in a way, probably the Australian women I mentioned right near the end, the women who worked at the Woomera ranges after the war, were more like that. They were employed originally as civilian computers um, to do manual calculations for the rocket range. So what they were doing was far more like what the hidden figures were doing. However, the huge contrast is that these were um, privileged women. They were all white. Um, they were given the best facilities. It was seen as being a plum job. Um, people were thrilled to do it. They were often used in PR, um, photos and so forth. Um, so in that respect, it's not really like the experience of the, the um, African-American women at NASA. Uh, but the kind of work has a lot of overlap, I would guess. Um, the, uh, you know, in that it was pre-computer calculations and then moving into the use of early computers as those came in. Um, there is a... Uh, a, an active group of retired Woomera people um, from whom I got some information um, and you know, it may be that there's more to be learned about them as well. Okay, thank you very much, Nina. Now that brings us to the end of our question period. We've exhausted the questions uh, with pretty much perfect timing, actually, uh, given uh, uh, that we're aiming to wrap up at half past nine. Um, so this brings us to the end of our programming uh, and I'd like to thank again all three of our speakers for sharing uh, their work with us uh, tonight. Um, I'd ask them to uh, turn off their videos right now so I can I can take center stage again if that's if that's okay for the last moment or two. Um, and to say, I mean, although we can't give our speakers a well-deserved round of applause in this virtual format, I would encourage you to thank them uh, and maybe uh, add the applause sign or some nice comments. Uh, and thoughts that you might have had uh, uh, in the comments, uh, the chat box now. Uh, and this is just to remind you that w today uh, has been the third of three week of, of six weeks uh, of talks and panels uh, marking the centenary of the Society for Army Historical Research. And I would encourage you to register for the remainder of the program uh, if you haven't already done so. Next week, just to give you a preview, we'll be hearing from Dr. Yolanda Hodson on the development of British military mapping between the 1680s and 1815, uh, as well as three panelists dealing with the disciplinary and policing uh, uh, issues uh, faced by the British Army from the Napoleonic Wars through to the Great War. I definitely encourage you again to register and attend. And finally, I'd like to thank again our speakers uh, and to Dudley Giles, I'd like to thank him especially for coordinating this session.
and I hope that everyone has a great night.